You have probably heard of past ice ages or that the climate was much warmer at the time of the dinosaurs. But did you know that large-scale continuous climate observations only became available starting at the end of the 19th century? So, you may be wondering, how is it possible to know the climate, and in particular what the temperatures were, long before the existence of thermometers thousands or even millions of years ago? The reconstruction of past climate is the field of paleoclimatology. One of the fundamental tasks of paleoclimatologists is the analysis of so-called temperature proxies. A proxy is an observable parameter that varies with temperature and that can be used to find out what the temperature must be. To understand how this works, let's consider a proxy commonly used to reconstruct the climate of the last few thousand years, the growth rings of trees. You may know that you can often determine the age of a tree by counting the number of rings in its trunk. These rings are formed by a sequence of lighter and darker wood growing during different seasons. In springtime, trees grow by forming new wood composed of large cells capable of transporting all the water and nutrients that trees need to support the new leaves. This wood makes up the light-colored part of the ring. In late summer, the growth slows down, the wood cells become smaller and the walls thicker, making the darker portion of the ring. In winter, trees go into hibernation and no longer produce new cells until the following spring. Because the growth rate of trees depends strongly on environmental conditions such as humidity, temperature and soil quality, by looking at the rings, in addition to counting the years, one can also get an idea of what the climate was like during each specific year. Scientific studies have allowed us to establish that under certain conditions, by measuring the thickness and the density of the rings in some trees, we can get a fairly accurate idea of the temperatures throughout the life of the tree. This is done in two steps. First, we must calibrate our scale. To do this, we use the temperatures recorded in recent years to understand how the data from the rings changes with temperature. Once this relationship is well understood, we can use the data from the tree rings to go further back in time to periods for which we have no direct observations. So, because there are trees that are a few thousand years old, we can use tree rings to find out the temperatures at least since the Middle Ages. Of course, the correspondence between the proxy and the temperature is never perfect, because factors other than temperature can interfere. In the case of tree rings, for example, a disease or an animal or a fire can sometimes affect the data. Nevertheless, by multiplying the number of studies and by improving the quantity and the quality of the data, we can still reach a good level of confidence in the reconstructions. This is why, most of the time, climate reconstructions do not use only one proxy, but a combination of different proxies. There are many different types of data that can help paleoclimatologists in their reconstructions. Some of it is qualitative. We can, for example, infer whether the climate was warmer or colder based on the type of sediments we find for a given period. Are they glacial sediments or are they the type of sediments that we would expect in a desert, for example? We can also study the geological record for fossils of microorganisms or plants or even pollens that would imply species preferring one climate or another. Other proxies are quantitative and are based on geochemical data. The most well-known quantitative proxy is based on the oxygen isotopes. What is an isotope and how does it work? Let's take a closer look. Like all elements, oxygen atoms consist of a nucleus, which contains protons and neutrons, surrounded by a cloud of electrons. The number of electrons and protons is fixed for each element. An atom of oxygen always has 8 protons and 8 electrons. But the number of neutrons can vary slightly. The vast majority of oxygen atoms have 8 neutrons as well. But there are also some atoms that contain 9 or even 10 neutrons. So we can have 3 different types of oxygen atoms, or more precisely, 3 different oxygen isotopes. To distinguish between the different isotopes, we use their atomic mass. Electrons have negligible mass, so we do not count them. Protons and neutrons both have a mass of 1, so the oxygen isotope with 
8 protons and 8 neutrons, has an atomic mass of 16. We call this isotope oxygen 16 O16. Atoms with 10 neutrons have a mass of 8 plus 10, 18. In this case, we are dealing with the isotope O18. Note that these three isotopes are so-called stable isotopes, and unlike the radioactive isotopes you may have heard of, they will always keep the same number of neutrons, no matter where they are or which chemical reactions they go through. In fact, we find these three different isotopes in all molecules that contain oxygen, such as, for example, water. I remind you that water molecules are composed of two hydrogen and one oxygen atoms. Since the O16 isotope is the most common, the vast majority of water molecules contains O16, but there are also water molecules formed with O18. The O17 isotope is actually very rare, so we'll ignore it for now. Now, since O18 is heavier than O16, water molecules with O18 are slightly heavier than molecules with O16. And this is very important because this mass difference makes the two isotopes move differently within the water cycle. Because the molecules of O16 are a little bit lighter, they need slightly less energy to transform into vapor. So, when the sun hits the oceans, the water molecules with O16 evaporate first, and the heavier molecules with O18 are left behind in the water. So, at least in theory, one would expect that as more and more O16 molecules evaporate, the concentration of O18 in the oceans should constantly increase. But within a few days, usually, the water vapor condenses into clouds and eventually falls back down. If this precipitation takes place as rain, the amount of water that evaporates is quickly compensated by the amount of water that eventually returns to the oceans. If this is the case, the balance between evaporation and precipitation allows for the amount of water in the oceans to remain constant, and the initial ratio between O16 and O18 will be restored. But what happens if instead of falling as rain, the water comes back as snow? In this case, it may become trapped on the continent for a long time, for example in a glacier or in an ice shield. For this reason, when global temperatures are low and there is more ice, we expect the amount of water in the oceans to decrease, and because less O16 goes back to the oceans, we expect the proportion of O18 to increase. As you can see, we can establish a direct relationship between temperature the amount of ice on our planet, and the variations in the concentration of O18 in the ocean. If we know how the concentration of oxygen isotope has varied over time, we can also know what the temperatures were like. So how do we do that? Fortunately, this information is contained in the geological record. Let me introduce you to some tiny microorganisms called foraminiferous, which have been living in the water or at the bottom of our oceans and lakes for at least 500 million years. Throughout the course of their lives, foraminiferous take up some of the oxygen in the water to grow their shells. So the ratio of O18 to O16 in the shells of the foraminiferous is the same as that of the water they live in. When the foraminiferous die, their shells sink to the bottom of the ocean and are, at least in part, preserved in the sediments. By analyzing the layers of marine sediments formed during different geological periods, and in particular by looking at the isotopic composition of the foraminiferous in them, geologists are therefore able to reconstruct the variations of the O18 O16 ratio over time and in turn to estimate the temperatures in the very distant past, up to several hundred million years ago. In addition to the two I have presented here, there are many other proxies. We can, for example, also directly measure the isotopic composition in the air bubbles preserved in ice. We can analyze the products of weathering in alluvial deposits, or we can use coral rings in a similar way that we use tree rings, and so on. In this video, I chose to present two proxies in some detail, rather than to make an exhaustive list of all the possibilities. But if you want to know more about something else, let me know in the comments below, and maybe we can make another video. In the meantime, I thank you all for watching to the end. As usual, I invite you to subscribe or to give us a thumbs up, and I'll see you soon for a new video. Bye-bye!